Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon. My name is Rachel Young, and today we're going to be doing some introduction to backyard birding. Yesterday, we had a little bit of technical difficulties posting my teaser video where I would have asked you to bring a pair of binoculars or a bird field guide with you. So we don't have those today. If you have one at home, go ahead and go grab it real quick. It may help you follow along while I'm talking. If not, that's okay because you don't really need binoculars since we are looking at birds in our backyards. So the first thing that I'm gonna go over is some tips and tricks to use your binoculars. Then we're gonna talk about different options for bird field guides. Then we're gonna go over some habitat things to maybe attract some birds into your backyard. And then we'll get to identifying some common birds in Kentucky. So first things first, let's talk about binoculars. There are so many different types that you could buy if you wanna get into birding. My goal for this program is to maybe inspire a handful of you to take up birding. It's great for your mental health. It helps me relax and a lot of my coworkers and myself really enjoy doing it. And that's why I'm gonna go over binoculars. So this is my pair. These are my trusty Nikons. I love them. They do exactly what I want them to do. When you are thinking about buying a pair of binoculars, you wanna make sure that they feel good in your hands and around your neck. Now, I'm not gonna put mine around my neck because it's gonna mess up my mic, so just use your imagination. If you're gonna be walking around in the woods or carrying them around for a long period of time, make sure that they feel good and comfortable in your hands. That's gonna be your most important thing, especially to me. This is another example of a pair. These are a little bit smaller. This is one of my coworkers pair and she really likes these. These are brand Alpen. When you start looking up binoculars, you'll notice that there's so many options, it's kind of overwhelming. So my suggestion to you is to actually go to the Audubon website. They have a fantastic binocular guide. They break it down into different types. So maybe you're looking for something cost effective, or maybe you're looking for something very small that you can carry around for a long period of time. So if you're looking to buy a pair, definitely check out that guide. Now, Let's talk about how to use these. When you get them, they don't come the way that you want them to. You have to adjust it. Both of these move, each side moves. So you're gonna wanna adjust that to your face. Make sure that both of these are over top of your eyes. If they're not, you're gonna get black circles on the edges of these binoculars. It's gonna look weird. You'll know if it's not right. Second thing you're gonna wanna do is adjust your clarity. This is a focus wheel. It helps you focus. So you're gonna to wanna to focus one eye at a time. So cover up one eye, focus it, cover up the other eye, refocus it, and it should be focused for both of your eyes when you use them both. If that doesn't work, keep playing with it. It may take a little bit to get it adjusted specifically to you. Now, second, when you're looking at a bird, my the biggest piece of advice I can give you is if you find a bird in a tree, lock your eyes onto that bird. Do not move your face, do not move your eyes. Bring these up to you instead of searching and trying to find what you were looking at before. When I lead bird hikes or do bird programs in person, the biggest question I get is, I can't find the bird, what am I doing wrong? And almost always that's it. You're bringing your binoculars up down here and then trying to find it. And it's really hard when everything's magnified 10 times, okay? So that's my biggest piece of advice for you for binoculars. So let's move on to field guides. There are a lot of different options for field guides. So I've listed five for you guys that I think are the most common and the most popular and the easiest to use. Peterson, Sibley's, Kaufman, Audubon, National Geographic, and if you don't want a paper guide, I suggest you download the Merlin Bird ID. If I had to pick one app to keep on my phone forever, it would be that one. I would say goodbye to Facebook immediately and keep my Merlin Bird ID app. I use the Peterson Guide. I got my first Peterson Guide. It's pretty beat up. Back when I was 18 or 19 years old, and I've been obsessed ever since, okay? So I use Peterson, but a lot of my coworkers use Sibley or they use Audubon. So here's a good example of a Sibley. 
okay? And Audubon is down here. Audubon is interesting because they use actual photos. I prefer drawings over photos because sometimes the lighting in the photos can be a little weird. Now they do a good job of picking really good pictures with those key identifiers for those birds. So it's not that big of a deal for a lot of people, but I do prefer illustrations, which is why I use the Peterson when you're picking out a field guide. You gotta pay close attention to one thing that has tripped me up in the past, and that is east versus west. If we put all of the United States birds into one book, it'd be thick, and you can get a full United States copy. But to me, it's easier to break it down into regions. We're gonna want the eastern region because that's where we live. If you're traveling out west, get the western region one. I have both because I travel a lot. But make sure you're picking one that says eastern, especially if you're a beginner so you don't get overwhelmed with all of the possibilities. An example of a National Geographic one to show you. But they are really light and compact. So they're a favorite for people that are traveling in the woods, hiking around. That's what they're gonna use because it's smaller and easier to carry. So we'll keep going, no questions yet. Now we're gonna talk about the birds. So in Kentucky, we get over 300 different species of birds that are residents or migrators. So we have two types of birds here, the birds that stay all year round and birds that fly through for migration. We are seeing some downward trends in population due to a lot of different reasons climate interference being the biggest ones. So we're gonna talk about what we can do to help these birds and maybe attract them to your backyard. The biggest thing to do is to create native habitat. Now I'm sure Michaela talked to you guys yesterday when she was talking about monarchs, about habitat for them. And the same goes for birds. We want it to be native, things that they would encounter here anyway. Planting native plants in your backyard is a great way to attract birds. I know not all of you have backyards though. There are a lot of you that live in cities, maybe live in an apartment. That's okay because you can create native habitat on your porch, maybe in a container, just like you would plant tulips on your balcony. So a few different types of plants. I'm gonna name these off. I don't have examples for you, but you can do a little bit of research later, maybe on ones that you would like to see. You're going to want to think about the birds you want to attract. So if you want to attract birds that eat bugs, you're going to want to plant plants that attract bugs. Goldenrod is a really good native plant that's going to attract little bugs. Maybe even some western sunflower birds that eat the bugs. Berries. We have a lot of birds that are berry eaters. So spice bush is a really good berry bush that you can plant pawpaws they're all over Kentucky and they're really popular with fruit eating birds and then your black cherry trees are another one now so we've talked about birds that eat bugs birds that eat berries there's two other kinds we've got birds that eat nuts and seeds so your trees your oaks and your hickories and your walnut trees and then your nectar eaters so coneflower asters and wild columbine are going to be those plants that you would plant for nectar eating birds all right, let's see if we have some questions real quick. Okay, Ed has a question. He wants to know, so he wants to attract hummingbirds. Great, great question, Ed. So I just kind of went over those nectar plants, cone flowers, your asters, your columbines, maybe even some of your milkweed will help out with that. So great question, Ed, and thank you for submitting. So we've talked about native plants. As you can see behind me, we've got some feeders set up. Feeders are a really good way of attracting birds to your home without having to use native plants. Now, I always suggest you use native plants first and then bird feeders second, just so that we are putting something back into the earth that way. As far as bird feeders go, there are so many different types, so many different types of seeds. So I'm gonna break down a few of them for you, maybe give you a little bit of an idea of what you can do after this. As when I think about feeders, my biggest piece of advice for you is not to buy the mixed seed bags, those big huge bags you can get at the pet store, at Tractor Supply, wherever, don't buy those mixed seed bags. What happens is two things. There's a lot of waste. A blue jay may land and feed on that mixed seed, but he's only eating one thing and throwing everything else on the ground. So that's gonna result in a lot of waste. That food on the ground can mold and mildew. 
So that's going to create a potential for disease as well. When you do mixed seed, it also creates a potential for lots of different types of birds to interact together. When we do single types of seed, that eliminates different species coming together. Now, it's not a foolproof thing. You still may have cardinals and blue jays feeding together, but that's better than having seven species on one feeder. Cleaning your feeders is really important. If you are going to have them, you've got to clean them. Well, it goes back to that disease things. Birds can spread diseases really quickly through feeders. So take them down once every couple of weeks, especially when it's hot. The hotter it is, the more frequent you need to take them down and clean them. You're going to want to clean them with a 10% bleach solution or dish soap. Either one of those things is going to work pretty well for cleaning your feeders. Your single types of seed you can use. Sunflower seeds, and there's two types of those, black oil, and striped, safflower seeds, which are a favorite among cardinals, thistle, which is a favorite among American goldfinches and indigo buntings, and then you might think about some cracked corn or some millet as well. All right, I think we have another question, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. All right, so Chan, age eight, wants to know, how do I get rid of starlings at my feeder? That's a really good question. We're going to go over European starlings here in a few minutes. Starlings are one of those birds that's non-native that was introduced a long, long time ago. They're one of those birds that we just kind of have to learn to live with. So my advice to you is to give your birds a lot of options, okay? Platform feeders, feeders that are flat that allow the birds to get up there. Tube feeders, like you see behind me, there's actually a chickadee behind me feeding at this tube feeder. You can do all suet feeders. Give those birds lots of options, okay? Lots of options and stagger them. Do some close to your balcony. Do a few 10 more yards away and a few farther. This is gonna maybe take those starlings from one place and put them into another. So that's a really good question. All right, we have another one. Let's let Nikki finish writing this down and then I'll answer it for you guys. All right, is there a way we can take a birding class? That's a really good question. Right now, this is kind of as close as it's gonna get because we are social distancing from ourselves. So I can't provide an in-person class right now, but that doesn't mean that there won't be opportunities for that in the future. So thank you for that question as well. Okay, so. Let's move on to the birds, the actual birds that we're going to be. Now, when I start talking about backyard birds, almost always the first question I get is, how can you tell if you're looking at a male or a female songbird? It's tough for a lot of birds. A lot of the birds we're going to talk about today, you cannot tell the difference. You'll be able to tell if it's a juvenile or an adult, and that's about it. So we're going to talk about the birds that you can tell the difference between male and female first. That is called sexual dimorphism, which if you've been following along with us for the past few weeks, you've probably heard that term before. I think a few of our educators have used it in the past. All that means is that you can look at that bird and know if it's a male or a female just by looking at it. So the first ones we're gonna talk about are birds that probably everybody has at least seen. You may not know it's a cardinal, but you have seen it around. So. First picture here is your male. The key identifiers on this guy is that red color, okay? We don't have a lot of birds that are totally all red. We do have a few that are red, but he's totally red and he's got a black chin and throat and black around his beak. His beak is also red and he's got a crest. So if you're not sure if you're looking at a cardinal, look for the black on his face and look for that crest. The females look different. You'll notice as I go that the females that we talk about are going to be a little bit more drab and dull colored than the males. And that is for a good reason. The females lay the eggs. They sit on the nest for the most part. So they're going to want to be dull so that a predator will see them. If she looked like this, they'd have a really good time seeing her in that nest. But because she looks like this, it's a little bit more difficult. You can tell this is a female cardinal for a couple of reasons. This red or pink bill, it is obvious, it is big. She's got a crest as well that doesn't go away for the females. And then you can see here, she's got a little bit of red. You'll notice that most female cardinals do have a little bit of red and that's a good key indicator of what you're looking at. 
Now, somebody asked about starlings earlier, and they are non-native, and we're going to talk about another really common non-native bird called the house sparrow. This is another one of those introduced that we just kind of have to live with. There are so many of them, you could look outside right now and probably see one. This is going to be your breeding male. He's got black throat, chestnut eye, and then white underneath it. This is going to be your female. She's really dull, and she really doesn't look much like that male except for her wings. So, look for this white eye line right here, and look for her hanging out with males and females of the same species. They like to hang out in groups. All right, our next bird is the American goldfinch. This is such a pretty bird to see. So many people get so excited to see these because of that bright yellow color. They just make so many people happy. As a matter of fact, we had an intern a few years ago who loved these birds. He hadn't seen one. He was obsessed with them because they're so pretty. This is your breeding male. He is a bright yellow, oops, bright yellow with that black spot on his forehead, those black wings with those white wing bars. That's your indicator that you're looking at an American goldfinch and that finch-like beak, that thick beak. We get a lot of yellow warbler species through Kentucky, especially this time of year. So it can get confusing. Just look for the finch beak and that's gonna cue you in to that's an American goldfinch. But the females look a little bit different. She looks similar. She's got yellow on her, of course, but she's dull yellow. She's not that bright, beautiful yellow that that male is. And that's gonna be for that same reason that the cardinal was dull and the female house sparrow was dull. But she's got those white wing bars, just like that male did. And you can see the yellow, almost olive on her back. Okay, we got a couple more questions. We're at a good stopping point. So let's see what I've got here. Ryan, late this year. That's a good question, Ryan. There is actually an interactive hummingbird migration map online. All you gotta do is search hummingbird migration interactive map and it'll pop up immediately. They should be here soon, fingers crossed. Now, I, the last time I checked, they were around Mississippi, but that's been maybe a week ago. So they're getting close that we should start seeing them hopefully soon. These cold temperatures may have stopped a little bit of movement, but they are coming, Ryan. Great question. All right. Lori, what is your favorite songbird? Uh, these questions are so hard for me because I love them all. If I had to pick one that we're talking about today, I would probably say the white-breasted nuthatch, and we'll go over him in a minute. And that's because they're so spunky and they're very cute because of the behavior that they exhibit, which I will talk about later. Okay, let's keep... My next bird is the white-breasted nuthatch. So this is another one that you can tell the difference between male and female, but this one is a little bit more difficult than the others. So what I've got here is the male. What I like to say is that the male is stark. He is stark black on top and stark white everywhere else with this really pretty blue-gray color. If you look closely, he's got some red down here right under where his wings stop. Okay, so our female is going to look really similar. She just looks messy. I think she looks a little unkempt, less put together than he does. She's gray right here instead of black and that's your best indicator that you're looking at a female rather than a male. If you notice in both these pictures, both of these birds look like they're climbing on bark. If you see a bird that is gray with a white belly and some red underneath climbing up and down a tree, you're looking at a white-breasted nuthatch. Now, they're called a nuthatch for a reason. They exhibit this really special behavior where they will take a nut, because they are nut eaters, and they will wedge it in a piece of bark and smack it with their beak until they hatch the nut open and get to the nut on the inside. So that's where they get their name from. All right, let's keep going. Now, we're gonna move on to the birds, the difference between male and female, okay? So we've gone over the ones you can, now we're moving on to the ones that you can't. So white-breasted nuthatches, if you see those, you are likely to see this bird as well. This bird is called a tufted titmouse. The first time I saw one of these birds, I was instantly obsessed. And every time I see one, I get so happy and they're so common. So it brings a little bit of joy to my day every day that I see one of these. Now, they look similar to the white-breasted nuthatch. 
But if you look right here, they have a tuft, which is where that tufted titmouse name comes from. Look for that tuft and look for the bronzy red color right under his gray wings, okay? So where there are titmice, there are gonna be nut hatches, and you're probably gonna find some chickadees as well. So let me find my chickadee picture, all right. In Kentucky, we have Carolina chickadees, and that's what this guy is right here. They are easy to identify, tiny birds, okay? They're one of the smallest to talk about today. This black cap right here, the white line that comes from the beak and the black underneath. And that's going to be your Carolina chickadee. Okay, we'll move on. Next, we're going to talk about one of the most chattery birds that you'll find in your front or backyard, the northern mockingbird. These are super easy to identify because of that super long tail. This tail makes up a lot of their body. You can't tell it from this picture because he's puffed up but this tail is long. He's got a long beak as well and a black eye stripe that goes from the beak to the eye. When they are in flight, I like to say that they have racing stripes. It's really obvious when a mockingbird is flying by because you, when they spread their wings, you get a flash of white on each side of the wings. These are mimickers. They will call and call and call and make all sorts of noises all day and sometimes even into the night. These guys are noisy, okay? If you hear a lot of different calls going in one single stream, it's gonna be this guy more than likely. We have a couple other mimickers in the state, but this is our most common one. All right, so we have another question rolling in. Is there a way I can support a songbird program? That's a really good question, and I was actually going to wait to the end to talk about that, but the best thing you can do to support songbirds and their habitat in our state is to join Kentucky Wild. You've probably heard of that if you've been watching with us for the past couple of weeks. That's going to be your best thing to do. That provides our avian biologists with equipment, with research equipment. That is how you can support songbirds in our state. Great question. Okay, so now we're going to talk about another tiny bird. He's a little bit bigger than your chickadee, the Carolina wren. Now in Kentucky, we have a couple of species of wrens, but this is the one you're going to see in your backyard. I live in Lexington and I have so many of these guys. These are the birds that say tea kettle when they call. I'm not going to go over calls today because we just don't have time, but that's why I suggested you download that Merlin app. This bird's easy because he has a wren beak, a long, slightly curved beak, and a very short, stubby tail, okay? This tail is short, very short, and usually they have it pointed up. So that's a good indicator that you're looking at a wren, and a Carolina wren has this white eye line, and then these black bars on his tail. All right. Next, we'll talk about two of the most common birds. We talked about cardinals. But these two are probably what you all are the most familiar with besides cardinals, an American robin and blue jays. I did this picture because I figured I would get some questions about blue jays being nuisances at your feeders. They like to travel together. Where there is one, there is five, and they are noisy and they are loud. So they like to eat a lot. They like peanuts. So if you have a blue jay problem, they like platform feeders or flat surfaces like you see here. Put out some peanuts for them farther away from your other bird feeders, and that may help your blue jay problem. American robins are a national treasure. Everybody at Fish and Wildlife loves these guys. They're our unspoken heroes. They love to eat worms. Anytime it rains, I go out in my backyard and I have 20 of these guys pecking around in my yard finding worms. Okay, so these guys are gonna be here whether you have a feeder or not. Okay, I have another question real quick. Let's take a pause. We'll go over our last two birds in a second. Camden, age nine. Do you know of any field guide? Kids, that's a really good question. My best suggestion for you, Camden, is to go on Audubon's website. They have a whole section just for kids, okay? Just for beginners and just for kids. So go check that out there. They have some quizzes that you can take from home, and then they have some publications that you can download, all right? That's a really good question. Okay, actually, I lied. I have three birds left. So let's talk about morning doves. Now these guys feed on the ground. 
If you want to attract morning doves, you can put some stuff on the ground around your feeders and they'll clean that up for you, okay? So this is what they look like sitting on a line. I like to show this just because these are really easy to identify from a far distance. They've got this sharp tail that comes down, these little, these heads right here, and then these plump bodies. These are super easy to see from a far away distance and they're usually sitting in a line. We don't have a lot of birds that look like this in Kentucky, but I will go over how to identify them really quickly. They have this cute little ring around their eye, these buff brown and gray bodies, and then these pinkish feet, okay? The long pointy tail and the plump body. And that's how you're gonna know you're looking at a morning dove. They're called morning doves because they call them song early in the morning. All right, our last birds we're gonna go over kind of all look the same. So we're gonna go by size first. Talk about the biggest one, American crow. Everyone pretty much knows what a crow is. They're loud, okay? And they're the biggest bird besides birds of prey that we're potentially gonna have in our backyards. They're all black or blue, depending on how the light hits them. They're bigger with these beaks, okay? They got a pretty big beak. Now, I may get a question about ravens. We don't really get ravens in Kentucky. We may get a few fish crows, but American crows are gonna be what we have for the most part. If you're ever wondering how to tell the difference between a crow and a raven, just for your own personal uh, beliefs, crows, I like to say, are birds with a beak. Ravens are beaks that have a bird attached to them, okay? Raven's beaks are so big, it almost looks unnatural. So that's a good way to tell what you're looking at. Now, the last two are our European starlings and our grackles, our common grackles. That's the species we have in Kentucky. Starlings were brought here a long time ago. I think a population was released maybe 1890, something like that. They, they released about 100 birds in Central Park because there was a group of people that wanted America to have every single bird species that Shakespeare ever mentioned in his writings. And this was one of them. So now we have them everywhere. They are non-native and we're probably never gonna get rid of them. It's just one of those birds we kind of have to learn to live with. But you know it's a star with a lot of them at once for the most part. They are iridescent. This picture does a really good job of showing the iridescence of this bird. They have some white spots right here. Those will show up in the sunlight and then a big yellow beak. This yellow beak is a good indicator that you're looking at a starling and not a grackle. Grackles have that iridescence as well, but it's only on the head and then down the back. They're really dull underneath here and they're probably twice the size of a starling. So if you see two sitting next to each other, it'll be easy to tell which one is which. So that's your quick crash course in how to identify seeing in your back or your front yard. So I challenge you all, while we have this extra time at home to explore and be curious about things, keep a bird journal. Log what you see. All you need is a composition notebook or a pad of paper, because that's what I do. If I see something that I haven't seen before, I jot down what day, what time, and what it was doing. That lets me know what I have and haven't seen because I like to keep track of it. Now, another thing, join Kentucky Wild. That's a good way to help from home right now. Another thing you can do, which is my favorite thing to do right now, is to learn bird calls. Once you get birding by sight down, switch to birding by ear. Close your eyes and listen to what's around you and attempt to figure it out without ever having to look. It's a fun, challenging game that I like to play when I get bored. Bird calls can be overwhelming, so my suggestion is learn five at a time. Learn all of these basic birds that I just showed you, but learn them five at a time. Get five down, move on to the next five. When you have all of these down, go down to three at a time and learn your harder birds, okay? Do we have any more questions? Is there any way I can log the birds that I see? Like I said, I recommend keeping a journal. You can also download eBird which is a good way to see what birds are around you and you can log your sightings in that as well. So get out there, do some birding. If you are inspired by what I just told you and you want to plant some native habitat, maybe for monarchs or for birds or for both, tag us in your pictures. Post those on Facebook and Instagram. Tag the Salado Center. We would love to see what you guys are doing at home right now. 
I feel like I've been talking to you all, but I want you all to talk to us. Tag us in those pictures. If you find a bird and you don't know what it is, post it and tag us and we, can be, we should be able to help you out with that. So thank you all so much for tuning in today.